Thank you very much. Um, so in this talk, we are going to present actually a few experiments that we did on how to use generative adversarial models to create new Iberian vessels. So as a little bit of background, after I finished my PhD back in Argentina, I was a postdoc visitor in the University of Jaén. And after I finished that visit, I joined the amazing Kenya lab of IBM Research. A little bit about the team. Uh, I like to say that it was uh, an ambition crossover against archaeology, ML, image processing, and computer graphics. Uh, so the, I was in the computer science department, but they already have um, existing research with their archaeological institute in the same city. So they have a lot of research around visualization for archaeology. They also have uh, augmented reality for it, ML, and decision support systems. So it's a broad spectrum of research. We are only talking about one of it. So actually, uh, the problem is like uh, ceramics vessels are super helpful for dating archaeological strata, provide evidence on how the community work in an economical or cultural level, and how is actually uh, the relationship between different cities. This is super helpful for archaeology studies, but unfortunately, uh, these ceramics are super fragile. Therefore, most of the vessels that archaeologists recover are broken, so they have to deal with a lot of fragment information. So the first approach was actually try to do registration and actually position of the fragments in a given vessel and try to say the family that they belong to. So when we start with basic augmentation uh, protocols, such uh, a fine transformation and stuff like that, we, uh, we find out uh, these generative adversarial models that can give us uh, similar new samples that still behave in the morphological way of the same uh, data that we were working with. So the idea here was actually giving 3D full uh, vessels to the computer graphics team, and they can actually uh, proceed with fractures algorithms uh, with different um, realistic levels, so they can actually have the full basal and actual different type of fragments. So the data set uh, was around Iberian wheel made pottery. Uh, this was a huge wink because we actually can use a uh, solid revolution because it was like physically the way that it was done. And these are from several architectural uh, archaeological sites of the Guadalquivir River is in the south of Spain. Uh, we have a couple of thousand profile binary images of uh, the contour of the vessels. And we actually have uh, classification information that one archaeologist made based on morphological criteria. So if you see in the, in the um, uh, right corner, you can see the profiles that we actually have. And uh, the other ones are the um, uh, uh, revolution solid uh, done. So we actually presented two approaches here. The first one is on top. Uh, we actually tried to do generative uh, networks with only 2D images. We were working with the profiles. And then after we have the new generated profile, which is the solid revolution, and then we have the uh, polygonal mesh ready to be broken. The second approach is a little bit more risky, but also super interesting, is actually moving in the volume space. What if we have all our data already as uh, 3D scan vessels, and we want the generated network to give us uh, the whole volume, so we lose the post-processing part that we have to do the uh, solid revolution? So the main scientific libraries that we use are uh, different uh, from our here are archaeologists in Indiana, we love Python. Uh, we use the scientific stack and it was super useful for two super huge reasons. First, we have the object-oriented uh, idea that we have the full pipeline program, so when we run over thousands and thousands of, of images, we have the pipeline batch mode ready, but we also have Jupyter Notebook that it was super easy to share with the other archaeologists and even on journals and other conferences the preliminary results. And it was kind of a, the same code, just showed in different ways. 
And I don't know your history, but for me, reviewer number two gives me a lot of nightmares. And actually having a reviewer two, not from computational, computational science background, saying that he was happy to actually see the code and the data, he was like, whoa, that's a sci-fi community right there, making progress. Um, so we basically use a lot of scikit image, uh, PyTorch, uh, the whole NumPy, uh, SciPad, MapleDip, and Jupyter, and we actually use TreeMesh uh, for using for working around the polygonal data. So you can handle a lot of different functions on it. I think this is a big change coming from image processing that we work most of our three-dimensional data in C++. Seeing this running in Python and so easy to use. It was really interesting. So as our previous keynote says, if you are in research, don't forget to cite them. For computer science, it's easy to remember, but when you go to, um, to interdisciplinary works, it's easily to forget. But now let's go a little bit of what adversarial means, or what are these uh, generative uh, networks talk about. So in any adversarial environment, we actually have two uh, actors that are uh, competing against each other, right? So in this example, we have Indiana and the boulder, right? So Indiana will always try to maximize the distance between the boulder and himself to actually stay alive. The boulder was designed to crush humans, right? So the boulder actually wants to minimize the distance between Indiana and himself. So if we take these two actors and we move these to neural network space, we will have gangs. Gangs were presented uh, by Goodfellow uh, 2014. In these five years, there are more than 100 different flavors of gangs. Uh, so it's a huge area for research. But the main idea now, let's think about the boulder at Indiana as networks. We will have a generator and we will have a discriminator. The generator will take noise. I will try to map it as the distribution of the real data. And the discriminator is actually in charge of figuring out if the sample that is being passed is going to be real or is generated. At the beginning, it's super easy because the generator is only taking noise. But later on, you will see that the discriminator will get full uh, a few times. So some basic uh, notations that we will see through the whole presentation, and if you are, super, if you are interested in um, working on gangs, you will find the same notation in all papers, tutorials, and so on. So X will be our data element. In our first approach, is a 2D image, pixel-based uh, binary. In our second approach, it's going to be a volume with a lot of voxels inside. So when the discriminator receives a sample, the output that it's going to give us is actually the probability to see if this is real or not. So at the beginning, the discriminator will be really good. I will give high probabilities when X is actually real data, and just at the beginning, it's going to give a lot of low scores to the generated data. Set is actually our latent space. Um, so this uh, noise vector actually is going to be passed through the generator. And the generator will be in charge of, from one dimensional uh, large vector, moving to the data space. This for us, again, is images or volumes. So when we actually have the output of the generator, and we pass it through the discriminator, the discriminator will give us the probability that he thinks that this generated data is real or not. So the discriminator will always try to maximize the probability of correctly classifying um, real data and fake data, while actually the generator is trying to minimize the probability that the discriminator will find out that his output is fake. So this is the Boulder and Indiana again in the context of gangs. So how do we actually train uh, these type of networks? Um, so if you're familiar with deep learning, the most common is training an autoencoder, a classifier, a regressor. You're always training one network. With GANGs, it's a little bit more tricky because you actually have to be training two uh, networks. And you should check out what type of information you're passing to each of these two networks. 
So let's update first the discriminator. If you see, we have set again is our uh, noise vector. X is going to be our real uh, data. First one, we pass uh, the real values to the discriminator, and we actually calculate the binary cross entropy between the output of the probability with the real data and the real uh, labels, our ground truth. Then we need to actually calculate the loss for the fake data. So we request the generator from noise to generate an output, and we pass this to the discriminator. We calculate the binary cross entropy again, but this is based on fake. Then we take both of the losses and we update our discriminator. If we move down to the code, we will update now the generator. So here's the tricky part. The generator only cares to get their output samples pass as true, right? So we actually only need to compare against the true ground truth labels. So this is exactly what we're doing when we uh, calculate the loss here. You will see is the fake output passed through the discriminator and the real labels. To the left, you can see the output of the generator in each epoch and each iteration that both uh, networks are learning. At the beginning, it's super noisy because we, our uh, Latin vector is going to be noise and the generator is not trained. But you can see over the iterations at epochs, we are getting better and better results. And now we have a kind of profile vessels over here. <coughs> so at the moment, we only speak about how was the training of these two networks. We didn't dig in the architecture of each of these two. So the discriminator is quite uh, um, simple and well known. It's going to be a convolutional neural net with a two output classifier that's saying if it's real or not. <laughs> but the generator is a little bit more tricky, uh, or at least it's a little bit more new structures. So the generator actually has to move from a Latin uh, vector one dimensional and I have to map it to our uh, data sample, for example, 64 by 64 uh, in a pixel space. So for that, there is something called <coughs> a convolutional transpose that actually is the normal convolution, but it's going to revert the spatial transformation. This is done with a bunch of uh, fancy padding. So what it gives you this is the capability of upsampling. So you will move from one dimension uh, vector and you will upsample till the output that you're um, hoping for. So this structure for having this uh, convolutional transpose um, batch normalization several times till you get to your data space uh, was presented on this again paper, a really nice paper to start if you are looking to work with images or 3D volumes around it. As I mentioned, uh, training gangs is a little bit more tricky. So there is a lot of instability while you're training. There is something called partial on total collapse. The network sticks to a subset of the samples only and doesn't generate the whole uh, distribution of the data. Uh, so in this paper, they found this type of uh, network configuration helps a lot uh, to the stability of the training. So uh, as in the left, you can see uh, some generated profiles, and then is the spin of the solid of uh, revolution. But actually, evaluating gangs is quite tricky, and there is a lot of uh, research going on there. How do you measure uh, that actual the sample that you're generating is quite good? So for that, uh, at the moment, we actually train a CGAN. These are conditional gangs that let us generate samples from a specific classes. So I can actually request, give me 1,000 samples of type 1 basal. So we did these 1,000 samples per each of these classes, and we pass it through a classifier that we already have for real data, real samples. So we got a, a nice accuracy. It was 89% uh, accuracy around actually saying the generated basal type one was correctly classified as if. 
But still, you have the question, okay, but maybe it's your network, it's just uh, memorizing all the samples and it's not giving me actual uh, new samples to add to the distribution, it's just copy pasting, right? That's why you have a high accuracy. For that, we did a lot of uh, dimension reduction over fake and real samples, and we did a little bit of clustering to see if they actually, when they overlap, they behave similar or you have a perfect overlap that is uh, overfitting actually the network. So in the bottom, you can see again, and this sequence of epochs, but this one was for the conditional gang. So now moving to the second approach, uh, more experimental at the moment. Uh, so the idea that we moved to this is because at the moment the Archaeological Institute was scanning all their uh, information with 3D sensors. And actually most of the fragments that are going to be in the future are going to be scanned in the same way. So it would be nice to actually reduce a lot of the pre and post processing and just keep it everything on the 3D space. There is a really nice paper on 3D GANs from MIT. I put at the end the link with uh, the code that I think is on TensorFlow, weights, uh, paper, and presentation. Super nice to see. As you see, uh, the generator is quite similar to the 2D that we presented early. But at the moment that we started this, we didn't have the 3D meshes. So we need to, again, from 2D, uh, generate the 3D meshes. So first we use a psychic image to actually find the contents and after we uh, did that, we actually extract equidistance coordinates and the same amount of points for all the samples. This had the reason because if you are familiar with geometric morphometrics, they use these similar marks to do uh, geometrical variance studies. So that was another line uh, that we used to. So actually, after we have these coordinates, we just spin the, um, the functions over the y-axis, and we have a few uh, nice revolutions uh, in the top of the slides. Uh, disclaimer, this was my first approach. Then the computer graphic people make amazing uh, remeshing and re-rendering of this. Right now, we are actually training the 3D gang again with these super smooth uh, vessels. But as I mentioned, uh, we actually need a voxel space. We actually need numpy, a huge numpy arrays in three dimensions that only have one and zeros to give us uh, uh, the speech and information in voxel space. Those are in the bottom. So the good news is actually uh, we use the same structures as I mentioned in the 2D gangs. The only thing is that we move all the operations to a 3D space and PyTorch amazingly has everything um, already set it up. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention early, there are uh, several parameters like uh, the kernel size that you're going to use, this dry, the padding and so on. I didn't want to overload the slides but at the end is the link of the repo that you can see the full implementation uh, with a Python notebooks calling in. Again, these are fewer epochs, but you can see at the beginning, the 3D structure is super noisy. This is the same as the 2D noise that we saw in the animation. And as you progress over the training, you actually have a uh, better shaped basils. So, I have a demo for this one, but my notebook didn't want to connect. Uh, but uh, after uh, we train the 3D GAN, we actually want to check uh, the raw output uh, after it goes to the whole pipeline of remeshing, smoothing, and so on. So we actually use um, Bistom, that is a development from Facebook for a dashboard that you can actually connect and anything that you pull from the network while you're generating, you can display it, and you can play around, it's interactive, so you can turn around basic uh, interactions of it. It's super interesting in this. Again, we use Psychic Image to actually get the vertices and the faces from the voxels, because if you remember, the output is going to be voxel space, and my Psychic Image already have marching cues to give us a polymesh. 
So we have a lot of future work. We actually need to compare these two outputs at the moment. And we also, we did a first run with uh, archaeologists. We showed the solid revolutions and they were like, okay, this one looks like Iberian vessels. This one looks like a vessel, but it's not Iberian. So it's really nice to actually have the, uh, um, the specialist at the end that gives us a hint. We are also really interested in variational autoencoders and treaty gangs because we know that it will be super helpful if our archaeologists go to uh, the site studies with only a camera and not a 3D sensor. I can have similar output out of it. And we also, we have one branch uh, working on fragment classification. If you see, this was the first uh, most easy fracture structure of our voxel space. So we actually have the information of each of these fractures with different colors and we have the full mesh. But the thing is, in archaeology, you will have tiny, tiny fragments, and you will have huge ones. So we actually want to provide what is the threshold of our solution. So anything below five centimeters, probably this network won't work, and so on. So we are benchmarking a lot around the sizes uh, of these fragments. And I think also that is super interesting from an uh, archaeology perspective um, for us is actually our texture information. We know that in these data sets we actually have texture about how the vessel was decor, and that talks about uh, for what was useful. So I think it will be super nice to not only have uh, morphological information but also texture on it. So some nice resources. Uh, Gang Hacks is going to give you like an easy read of the DC Gang paper, and it's going to tell you why you should use some architectures on or how to initialize the weights. Uh, the 3D Gangs paper is a great start, and in my repo you will find all this implementation plus these slides that are super heavy for the gifts. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've got a few minutes for questions. Hey, Celia, great work. Thank you. I, I was curious, there, there's some networks people have designed some mechanisms for, for more for classification, like spatial transformer networks that are specifically focused on doing stuff like transforms into certain space. Mm -hmm. So have you all thought about maybe if I train again on this, is it better at uh, those transformations or maybe going in the other direction? Like, you know, uh, doing classification would work better if I first trained to, to be a GAN. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Like, how would those interact with each other? Yeah, for sure. So at the beginning, we start with these uh, transformation networks, but most of them behave uh, with, uh, with affine transformations. So it's going to be uh, the same of classical rotations, translation, and so on. Uh, so we found that with, at least with gangs, we have a quite uh, diverse range of new samples. Some of them quite off, uh, and some of them quite good. Uh, but it gives an uh, interesting uh, liberty on that. And actually, the point that we actually want to do this merge with variational autoencoders and have to be able to this Latin space translate to 3D from one picture, it was also why we push on this uh, uh, type of network. Got it. So basically, just the affine transforms just aren't enough. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. Any more questions? I don't see any hands. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much.